let me tell you about a statistic that even I didn't believe when I first read it. This comes from the National Association of Colleges and Employers. They do an annual survey. And they ask employers, uh, here are 10 traits of people who might be seeking employment. How do you rate these things? Scale of one to five, each of them. All right? In 2016, you know what came out at number one and edged out everything else? It was verbal communication skills. This beat out technical skills. It beat out teamwork. It beat out problem solving. It beat out leadership. And I think there's probably two reasons for that. Number one, it helps with all the other stuff. And number two, we crave what we don't have. They're not seeing it, okay? They rated that number one because they're not seeing it, they're not getting it. If they got it, they wouldn't care, but they care now. So, how big are verbal communication skills in your future? Look at it this way, figure quadrants. Down here skills are low, up here skills are high. If someone is up here and they've got problem solving, and they've got leadership, and they've got technical skills, and you've got those too, but you've also got verbal skills, then you're alone in this quadrant. And that's exactly where you want to be. You want to be distinctive. You want to differentiate yourself in the job market. And the verbal skills are how you're going to do it. Now, I'm going to take this in three stages today. We're going to start tight, and then we're going to broaden our focus. We're going to start off with a few, just a few hacks that you can use now as chapter leaders. And you can, you can continue with this in your everyday life, OK? You can take this, uh, you'll probably use some of these at least once a week during your, your work life. All right, I'm going to give you four, four word phrases. And this is the first one, all right? I need your help. Do you know how powerful this is? This is powerful. Whoever you say this to feels important and obligated at the same time. Now, you notice this is not a question. This is not, can you help me, to which the answer could possibly be no. It's, I need your help. Bam. And you'll find that people are pretty much on your side when you do that. This is something that you need to use. Here's another one. I need this because you give a reason. It makes you sound rational. Harvard did an experiment back in the 70s. It's still spoken of. Uh, the psychologist had a research assistant go to people who were lined up at the copy machine. And she asked him one of three questions. She said, hey, can I cut in? I've got five copies. And 60% of the time, they'd let her cut in, OK? Now she'd go up and she'd say, can I cut in? I'm in a big rush. No, 94% let her in. She gave a reason. All right, now here's the kicker. The third question was, can I cut in? I've got five copies, and I need to make copies. 93% still let her in. Of course she needed to make copies. What else does anybody do in there but to make copies? But because she gave a reason, they let her in. All right? I need this because. Give a reason. Now here's something. I will find out. This is the credibility thing. Anybody ask you something? You ever attempted to bluff? Yeah, and, and you say you know that? Listen, I went to school. One of my fraternity brothers was infamous for this. And he, I think he spent his life thinking he was getting away with it. You know, and I mean, he wasn't. He was not getting away with it, and everybody knew it. This is the credibility thing. You say this, and it, or you can say, I can get that data, which is a little bit more commanding, all right? And you get credibility that way. Bluffing. It's the road to ruin. First of all, they know you're doing it. And secondly, it does your character no good. Finally, oh, this is golden. This is golden. When you are presenting to somebody and they ask you a question, the important thing is helps you bridge back to your message. You should always have a message and be able to bridge back to it. So if you're working for the Department of Public Works and somebody says, one of these road repairs is going to be done. You can say something like, I know that these traffic delays are annoying. But we're working night and day. The important thing is that we get this work done this summer so we can have safe roads year round. Bam, you keep going back to your message. The important thing is, if you're doing a stand up in front of a reporter, this is gold. You can say this or you can say, what we should be asking is something to get you back to your message, all right? 
four four-word phrases, all right? Simple hacks, you can use these. Now I'm gonna give you something that involves three stages, all right? And this may be the most important thing I tell you today. Feel, felt, found. I know how you feel. I felt the same way at first. What I found was when I followed the evidence, it took me over in this direction, okay? Feel, felt, found. So in practice, it might sound something like, I know that you must be dreading this merger. Uh, everybody wonders if their job is on the bubble. Um, what I found is that the last company I worked for when this happened, a lot of people were worried about the same thing. They didn't think their record would help them. But they felt the same way. What they found, though, was that management was looking at their energy, and it was looking at their follow-through, and that influenced the decision of who stayed and who, goed, or who goes. So this gives, what do we do here? We just did three things. I took the, the individual concern, and I made it a group concern. I evoked my own personal experience, and I gave them hope. All right? That's what happens with found. You give them a positive. It can be hope, it can be something else. But it's got to be positive. Feel, felt, found. I like this because it changes people's point of view without confronting them. It's non-confrontational. It's kind of like a verbal jujitsu. Somebody pushes, if you push back, they just put their toes in a crack. They won't move. If they push and you pull, then you can maybe change their direction. Maybe you can change their direction. This is great, but here's a word of warning. You cannot use this lightly. You cannot use this lightly. You can't just, you just pull this out of your pocket and think it's gonna work. If you don't appreciate the pain they're going through, if you don't care about what they're feeling, this will be seen as a patronizing tactic and it will fall apart. You've actually gotta know what you're doing, but it's invaluable if you use it, all right? Just simple things that you can use now. I wanna broaden the focus now and talk about something you're probably starting to think about, job interviews. Okay, anybody been thinking about that? Oh, come on, more than that. You know you have. And if you haven't, you will be pretty soon. How do you stand out in a job interview? What are they gonna ask you? How do you handle yourself? I'm gonna talk about that, and when I'm done with that, I'm gonna talk about how to make a presentation generally in front of people, because they'll be asking you to do that one of these days, and it looks good if you know how. So what do we have here? We got a guy on a telephone interview. Now you notice two things about him. Number one, he's dressed up, and the other thing is he's standing up. Because those things both affect his voice, and the voice is all they got to go with. Yeah, I know nobody can see him, he knows nobody can see him. But he's dressed up anyway, because it makes him feel more professional. And when you feel more professional, you sound more professional. And he's standing up because he sounds more energetic when he's standing up, all right? And he's on the phone here, and by the way, this guy has made very careful to make sure that the Wi-Fi is secure, that the battery is charged, that there's no background noise, that everything is ready to go, that everything is good, okay? He's got, and he's got one advantage that the live interviewee doesn't have. He's got notes. You can't see him here, but he's got them, and he can refer to them. He's got his list of questions to ask. He's in good shape, and when he's done, he will say, is there anything else I can provide you? Which is a, which is a good professional way to end your phone interview. So phone interviews are fine, and if you make the cut, then you go to the live interview. Oh yeah, the live interview. This guy's smiling, he's making eye contact, he's dressed for the occasion, but let's talk about that for a minute. When I was young, it was easy. You went in a coat and tie. Everybody wore a coat and tie. Men wore coat and ties wherever they went. It's not so easy today, all right? Now if you're going corporate, if it's a corporate interview, yeah. Dark suit, tie, long sleeve shirt, leather belt, okay, polished conservative shoes. That's still corporate, and you still do it. But there is also a thing now called business casual. All right, what's business casual? All right, khakis, gabardines, cotton slacks that are pressed, a nice, again, long sleeve, button down collar shirt, open collar, and leather shoes, leather belt. That's still a good thing, all right? Now, there is a third category out there today, though, that we call startup casual. So you're going with an innovative company. You're going with an online company. Nobody has ever, ever worn a tie there in their life. What do you wear to that? Well, again, you can wear 
khakis and any nice top. That might do it. Uh, there's some places that, that have a, a nice t-shirt with a jacket over it. That's fine. They do it that way. Here's what you got to do. You got to find out where are they on that spectrum. Is it corporate? Is it business casual? Is it startup casual? And then dress to the top of that level, whatever it is, because that shows respect. That shows respect when you come in. And when you do come in, oh, by the way, one more thing. This guy is not wearing cologne. Leave the cologne at home. All right, listen, I had one fraternity brother whose cologne got there a minute before he did. You don't want to do that, all right? That you don't want that to be what they remember about you. You want this to be what they remember about you. All right, let's talk about some questions. What are they going to ask you? That's the tee shot. That's there. All right? Open. What's he going to say about himself? Here's what you don't say. You don't begin with high school or earlier. All right? You don't go through your resume point by point. You hit some high points. If you're smart, you're ready for this. I'll tell you what. If you do not spend three hours preparing for this question, you're not ready for the interview. Have some stories about yourself, some success stories. Tell them about something you did well and how well you did it, okay? Tell them about something that you overcame. Tell them about uh, the brochure that you made that, in, that increased uh, donations for that charitable organization by 20%. Give them something real life. They like real life stuff, all right? So if you can do that, do it. But the thing is, have this in your hip pocket, and when they say go, go. And don't take more than two or three minutes. Don't give them your life story. Just tell them good things about yourself, tell them your nature, your ambitions, and evidence that supports that. All right? So that's the tee shot. Here is a sand trap of a question. Yeah, when they ask this, how do you answer? I will tell you how you don't answer. You do not take a strength and take it to an extreme and portray it as a weakness, because that's bullshit and they know it, and they hear that 20 times a week. They, they hear, oh, I'm so, I care so much about my job, I don't have any private life. No, that's bullshit, and they know it. So don't damage your credibility. You know how you handle this? Let me tell you what you do. Put together an Excel spreadsheet and list your actual weaknesses. This is just yourself backstage, okay? Nobody has to see this but you. So, uh, do you procrastinate? Are you habitually late? Are you confrontational? Do you tend to point the finger at other people when things go wrong? What, what are your actual weaknesses? OK, list them. Be real. And then in column B, say, here's how I handle each one. I'm habitually late, so I set five alarms, so I'm never late. I tend to procrastinate, so before I get a chance to, to start stewing in something, I deliberately jump in the deep end so I can get going. What do you do to handle these things? That's what they want to hear. They know you've got weaknesses. What they want to know is, do you know how to handle them? And if you can show them you do, then you get credibility and you keep going forward. Guys, if they've already decided to hire you, they will not ask you this. If they've already decided, you won't hear this question. So if you hear this question, it means you're still in the running. All right, you still got a chance. Why should we hire you? When I was little, my mother instilled in me the, the, the great virtue of modesty. This ain't a time to be modest. You tell them how many things you do well, how will you do them? You have a need here, you say to your potential employer. You're looking for somebody to do this job. Here's the evidence that I'm the one you're looking for. I have the ambition, I have the experience, and I have the dedication. That is why you should hire me. Just, be, just toot your horn. That's what they're looking for. Give them good reasons. This is a stupid question. All right, you're probably going to hear it, but I'm going to be the first to say it. This is a stupid question. I don't know where I'm going to be in five years. When the five years are up, I'll tell you about it. I don't know why they ask this, but I can tell you that they're probably looking for your stick to -itiveness. Are you still going to be here in five years? All right. I'll tell you how you don't answer this. Don't look at the interviewer and say, I want your job. No, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. Don't do that. That's more bullshit, and they know that, all right? So you don't do that. You can say something about how, 
what I would like to do, in, in, I hope that after five years, I've learned the industry and I've learned the issues and I'm in a position to be trusted and maybe undertake some supervision. Uh, in any case, I hope to be working for you and do it, working at the best of my ability. Something along those lines. Now these next questions may not seem alike. You may get something like this. Or like this. Or like this. <sighs> Off the wall questions, out of left field questions. You know what? This is all the same question. What they're asking is what do you value? And they ask these things to find out. What kind of people do you like working with? Well, if you like working with people who, for example, can be relied on and believe in what they're doing, maybe they figure that that's what you value. If when you give them a favorite childhood memory, they're going to see, it, is it something about overcoming a challenge? Are you going to tell me about the, the, the time that in spite of your skin knees you learned to ride a two-wheeler? What are you going to tell them? And tell me about your father. Not everybody has a great father, but enough do that this is a question that reflects what you think is good in life. All right? Uh, I, I, a psychologist, uh, an industrial psychologist, once asked me that. And I said, well, I admire him. He started off at the labor gang at a refinery, and by the time he retired, he was safety and training director of the company. You know? And he built, a, he built himself up. And that told the psychologist, aha, this is what this guy admires. He'll probably try to build himself up, too. That's what they're trying to find out. So, I don't know what left field question you're gonna get, but whatever left field question you get, this is probably what it's going to, okay? Any questions for me so far on this? No, all right. I'm gonna go on to the main event then. How to give a presentation. Maybe you're not gonna be asked to give a pre presentation early on, but you'll be asked to attend them. And you'll probably want to run screaming out of the room for most of them, because most people have no freaking clue how to give a good presentation. I'm going to give you some of the inside information this morning, OK? We're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about content, how you get content organized in your presentation. We're going to talk about the visuals that you use in your presentation. And we're going to talk about platform skills, how you actually deliver when you're up there, OK? And we're going to begin with the content. So many people, when it comes time to plan their presentation, don't plan a thing. They put up the first slide, they fill it full of information. They go to the second slide, they fill it full of information. They go to the third slide, they fill it full of information until they've used all the information. If you do that, you will fail. Because nobody can absorb all that information in the 20 minutes you've got to deliver. The human brain doesn't work that way. See, you knew this stuff. It's internalized. For you, this is easy. Audience has seen it for the first time. They can't follow it. So here's what you do. Before you get out the first slide, here's what you do. So few people do this, it is a crime. Don't you be guilty of it. Who's going to be there? What do they know about the subject already? What do they feel about it? What matters to them? What appeals are likely to work? Okay, I mean, some people are all about the money. Some people want to make the world a better place. Some people want efficiency. Find that out and find out what appeals are likely to work with those people. Listen, if you take this step, if you spend an hour on this, you have walked a mile in the right direction. Analyze your audience, and when you've analyzed it and you know about all of that, that is point A. Now, what are you there for? What are you there to do? Do you want to make people aware of something they weren't aware of before? Do you want to change their attitude about something or modify it in some way? Do you want them to do something? Do you, do you want them to approve a budget or buy a ticket or make a phone call or write a letter or show up? What is it you want them to do? It's either awareness or attitude or action, one of those three probably. Maybe you can't do all three at once. Do what you can. But whatever that objective is, that's B. So. Before you start your first slide, you got to have your arc that takes you from A to B. That's how you start a presentation. They're at A now, and I want them to go to B. How do you do this? A lot of approaches, but I'll give you one central tip right now. Use the power of three. 
Use the power of three. Omni trium perfectum. All that is three is perfect. That's what the Romans said. How many things do you know that come in threes? The, the, you know, the, the three little pigs, uh, the, the three stooges, uh, Scrooge is visited by three ghosts. Uh, we, we, we learn our ABCs. We stop, drop, and roll. Everything comes in threes. And the reason for that is we can remember three things. We can remember three. I got a lawyer friend who says, if I give a jury 14 points, they don't remember any of them. I give them three points, they remember all three. You decide what the most important three things are you want your audience to take out of the room. And that's what you go to. Here's what you do. You got your objective in the middle. And you bring in your key message points. One, two, three. And having done that, having decided what those should be, you make talking points for every one of those three. How do I say about this? What else can I say about it? What else can I say about it? How about this? How much evidence can I, what's the evidence for this? What's the evidence for this? This is the heavy lifting. This is where most of the work gets done. And you haven't started your slides yet, all right? But you decide and you keep coming back to these three messages. Like a songwriter keeps coming back to a refrain in a song. So they hear it over and over again. And when they finally leave the room, they've got it and your job has been done, all right? The message triangle, don't forget to use it. And persuasion. Let me tell you about a guy named Robert Cialdini. He is professor emeritus at Arizona State University and he's devoted his academic career to finding out what persuades people. What persuades people? He actually quit academia for five years and he went out and he sold used cars and appliances just to actually see how these principles applied in real life. And he came back and he said, you know, there are thousands of techniques for persuasion. There are thousands of them. But I believe they all come down to no more than, no more than a half dozen principles. And I mean, you can read about it. You can read his Harvard Business Review article. You can buy his book, Influence. It's a great book. But I'm just going to give you the praise. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version this morning. The half dozen principles. When you want to persuade an audience, keep these in mind. And here's number one. Do they like you? Yeah. Hey, whenever you talk to a salesman, have you noticed how agreeable they are? Have you noticed that? About any opinion you express, they're likely to echo that. And they're doing that on purpose because they want you to like them. Likeability is very important. How do you do this? Well, number one, you evoke similarities. 29% of professionals say easy conversation and personal commitment are the things that convince me that someone is good, that makes me like them. All right? So there's got to be something similar between you and the audience. Like, we're all ATOs. All right? Now, I wouldn't say this in front of any, every audience. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go in and say, hey, I was an ATO, you know, unless they are, or at least a fraternity member. They might not care about that, but you do. So this is something that I remind you of. Now, is your audience the same age as you? Do they come from the same part of the country? Uh, do they attend the same schools? Uh, do you like the same movies? There's got to be something, some similarity you can evoke. The other thing is compliment. I got a son who sold vacuum cleaners door to door for a while. And they told him, uh, what you've got to do is if you, someone admits you to their house, you've got to look around and come up with three sincere compliments about that house. Absolutely. People like to be complimented about their house. It makes them like you, and therefore more likely to buy a vacuum cleaner, or an idea, or whatever it is that you are offering. Yeah, mutual back scratching. Mutual back scratching. We're kind of wired that way. Um, disabled American veterans for years sent out a letter, a charity letter, and they got a pretty good return, about 18%, which, which is not bad. And then they began doing something else. They sent out gummed return address labels. You know, with, they already had the guy's address, so, so you just put it on little labels and you put it in there. It's a little gift. Contributions increased from 18% to 35% just on account of those labels. That's all they were doing. Um, listen, any of, you, any of you guys wait tables at some point in time? I see a few hands, yeah. So your tips, my guess is that your tips kind of evened out over time. Some people tip well, some poorly, but it kind of evens out, doesn't it? All right, let me, let me tell you something. You ever go back waiting tables? Here's something for you. They did an experiment. They got a baseline for tips, all right? And then they said to the, to the waiter, leave a mint. Just leave a mint, all right? When they left a mint, the average tip rate went up 4%. It 
which is modest, but it's in the right direction. Now they said leave two mints. If they left two mints, the tip rate went up 14%, more than three times as much. Okay, are you listening? Here's the kicker on this one. You leave one mint, and then you walk away, and you say, you know, you're nice people, and leave a second one. Now your tip goes up 23%. 23%, gentlemen, and all you did was give them a mint. That's it. You gave them a little mint. And it's not even your mint, it's the restaurant's mint. But people feel obligated. When you give something that you don't owe, that is not owed, and you take the initiative of doing that, people feel they've got to reciprocate. And that's the secret of reciprocity. That's another persuasive principle. Social proof. Social proof. Fish are not the only animals that cue off of each other and swim in schools. Primates do it too. We follow what other people do. We almost can't help ourselves. Uh, if you see people lined up on the street, you presume there's something valuable at the end of that line. Otherwise, all those people would not be standing there. We just believe it. Look, you see one of these hanging on your shower? All right, this thing? It says, help us support our planet's well-being by hanging your towels so they can be used again. All right? Now, I can tell them how to make this better. All right, because this was actually done as an experiment, these very things. You can say, oh, it's, it's good for the earth, uh, it, it's nice, and, and so that, that's fine. But if you say 75% of the people who stay in this hotel hang their towel so they can be used again, now that rate goes up by 23%. If you say 75% of the people who stay in this room hang up their towels so it can be used again, now it goes up 32%. We want to be the same as other people, especially if they're like us, especially if they're similar to the way we are. So if you want people to sign up for the benefit plan, don't just describe the benefit plan. Tell them how many people have already signed up for it. If you want your chapter brothers to do something, don't just say it's a good idea. Say, these people have already done it. Look at these people. That is the principle of social proof. Other people are doing it, and they're like me. Therefore, it must be a good thing to do. If you write something down, you are more likely to do it. People who make lists know this. I've been married 45 years to a woman who makes lists all the time. She runs rings around me because I don't make lists. But I probably should because whenever I do, I find I have a better tendency to actually follow through and get it done and cross it off the list. Heck, there was a, a doctor's office that initiated the thing. That, you know, They give you a card saying, here's your next appointment. Instead of filling it out and giving it to someone, they had the patient fill it out and their turn-up rate went up 40%, just because people had written down their own information. Oh, commitment's important, especially if you can do it publicly. If you get somebody to stand up and say, yes, I'm going to do this, chances are a lot greater they will. When we make a public commitment, we stand up. We say we're going to do it. So if you can get a commitment in something small, then you can get a commitment in something a little bigger, and a little bigger, and a little bigger, all right? Commitment is big. Get people to take that small step, and they'll keep going. Authority. Now, I'm not talking here about hierarchical authority, all right? I'm talking about expertise. I'm talking about somebody knowing what they're talking about, all right? Because when we have authority, then we, th we think we're safe. We think we can go ahead and we can do that. Authority i tell you what, my doctor asks me questions and does things I wouldn't let another human being on the face of the earth do. Because he's my doctor, I let him do it, all right? Authority is a good thing to appeal to, and it doesn't necessarily have to be your expertise. Appeal to somebody else's expertise. Nine out of 10 doctors recommend, you know? Or whatever it is. If you can appeal to expertise, people tend to bow to that and say, oh, well, okay. We know that those guys know what they're doing. We know those women know what they're talking about, so we go along with them. All right, authority is a good one. And here comes my favorite, scarcity. And you were wondering, who is this and how does this symbolize scarcity? I'll tell you the story. It's, it's, uh, it, it, this story dates from 500 BC, all right? The woman you're looking at is the Delphic Oracle. And she has under her arm the full Delphic prophecies. Now, there is a cave 
There was a cave in Delphi. And I mean, the cave is still there, and they say, you know, there's a gas that comes up through the cracks in this thing. It's more powerful than nitrous oxide. You breathe this in, and pretty soon you're talking out of your mind. And while the Delphic oracle was talking out of her mind, there was a priest taking it down. And these became the Delphic prophecies. Because it was presumed the gods were talking through her. So if you're a king, you know, the Delphic prophecies are invaluable. You, you, you'll know which way to jump. You'll know what to do, even though it needs some interpretation. So she is on her way to see the last king of Rome. You see, before Rome was an empire, it was a republic, but before then it was a kingdom. Historically, traditionally, there were seven kings of Rome, and the last one was Tarkin Superbus. And she stood before him with her scrolls and said, I've got for you the full Delphic prophecies. He's like, whoa, oh, okay, what, what are you asking for him? And she gave him this exorbitant amount of money. And he said, oh, I, <laughs> not, I, I can't pay that amount of money for those. So she opened up the first case, took out three scrolls, threw them in the fire. She said, six scrolls left, same price. <laughs> he said, well, I, I, I wouldn't spend that for nine. I'm not going to spend them for six. She opened the second case, took three more scrolls, threw them in the fire. Three scrolls left, same price. And those he bought. He bought them. He could have had all nine. But he paid that amount of money for three. And why? Because they were disappearing. When things get scarce, they grow more valuable. Buy now while supplies last. Sale ends on Friday. This deal is only good tonight. Salespeople use this all the time, the principle of scarcity. If it's going away, it gets more valuable. And if it's rare, it's valuable too, if it's hard to get. Hence, verbal communication skills. They value them more, OK? So all of these principles are together. Now, let's go through them one at a time. Remember, they are likability. Make sure that you understand the similarities you have with your audience and evoke them. Reciprocity. If you give them something, they'll feel obligated to give you something back. Social proof. If other people are doing it, it must be a good thing to do. Commitment, authority. They came up together, they weren't supposed to, but what the heck. Commitment and authority. If you can get people to commit to something, they're more likely to do it. If you can cite an authority, some form of expertise, they're more likely to believe you. And finally, scarcity. If it's disappearing, if it threatens to go away, it is therefore more persuasive. Okay? Let's move on. Let us talk about visuals. I will tell you what kills most presentations. They stuff their slides with words. And then they turn around and they read them to you. This is the number one complaint when it comes to PowerPoint presentations. The speaker read the slides to us. I'm going to talk about the magic of visuals. This human brain, divided in two. The human brain is not really divided like this visually, but statistically, it kind of is. 55% of our brain is devoted to visual interpretation. Did you know that? 55% of our brain is devoted to visual interpretation. And that is why this is true. That's why this is true. Now, let me talk about the picture superiority effect. I'm going to say a word. Beer. Did something like that just come into your mind? Or maybe something like this? Probably. Probably, this is not what came into your mind. We don't think in words. We think in pictures. And if you put a picture in front of somebody, bam, they're there automatically. They can't help themselves. Look at this. See, you're trying to look at the word, aren't you? But you can't. Your, your eyes keep going back to the picture, don't they? Here, I'll give you another example. This is one of my favorites. See, they know you can't help yourself. Visually, you've got to look. You can't help yourself. So use pictures. Pictures will draw people's attention. And the beautiful thing is they can look and they can listen at the same time. Good PowerPoint slides are simple, gentlemen. They act like billboards. Here's one of my favorite billboards, OK? See, this, this has a lot going for it. It's 60 miles an hour. 
At 60 miles an hour, this has a lot going for it. Number one, it's unusual. You know, you've got the visual joke of the heavy guy tilting the billboard. But the other thing is the simplicity of words. Look what's not up there. I don't see an address. I don't see a map. I don't see open and closed hours. I don't see a URL. All I see is a phone number. That's the jumping off point. If you call that number, they can give you all the rest, but you gotta call the number. And they make it easy enough that you remember the number and you remember, because you pass this probably several times a day and you know what to do. All right? This is great. And your slides need to be as simple as this. Take your slides, print them out on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, put them on the ground and look down at them. If they do not immediately telegraph a message to you, you're doing it wrong. They gotta telegraph a message like this. Try not to put words on your slides because people read faster than you talk. You talk about 125 words a minute. If they're college educated, they read it about 250. All right? So what that means is if you put on a slide with words in it, they're going to start reading it. They'll stop listening to you. They'll start reading. And they'll finish before you're done talking. You'll be a bullet point too. They'll be done. So that is why you don't put words on the slide. They do fine in your mouth. They do fine right there. And if they need notes, you can give them uh, an appendix. You can give them a handout. You can give them something to carry away later, all right? But you don't put it up on the screen. You don't put it up on the screen. There's a reason. Yeah. There's a reason that we cannot listen and read at the same time. And it's that little red area right there. It's located right above your left ear. It's called Wernicke's area, named after the German physician who identified it in 1874. He found that whenever a patient came in with that area damaged, they could not understand language. They could not read language. All of language interpretation takes place right there. All right, now you'll note that that's not half of the brain. It's not like visuals. It's a lot smaller. And that is one reason that when you're reading and somebody says, hey, let me talk to you, you stop reading and you start listening. You can't do them both at the same time, not easily. It's like there's one circuit there, and, and, if, and if somebody starts talking, like all circuits are busy, and you've got to break off. So if you fill your slide full of words, they're going to read them. They will not listen to you, and you lose control of your presentation. Don't put words up on a screen except minimally. Let them just be a point, and you talk from that point. We call that point plus. You put up a point, and you talk from it. All right, because the brain won't let you do anything else. Now let's talk about my favorite part. Let's talk about delivery. Yeah, don't do this. I would be surprised if any of the speakers, I mean, th there was a time of oratory where speakers stood up behind their castle of a podium and they had their remarks written out and they read them. And there's two reasons you shouldn't do that. Number one, if they're written out, they're probably written for the eye and not the ear. All right, the eye can follow long, complex sentences. You can reread parts of it if you want. But if you're writing for the ear, it's gotta be subject, verb, object. It's gotta be quicker, it's gotta be conversational. All right, and normally we don't write that way. That's number one reason not to do this. The number two reason not to do this is that you're not making eye contact. See, I'm looking out right now. I'm trying to make eye contact with people. And, with, and this is one of the most valuable things a speaker's got. It's eye contact, actually talking with people. You look down at a piece of paper, that goes away. Plus, usually, your shoulders are a little hunched. I'll tell you what, never do. Never put your notes on a phone and read from them. Number one, it looks insulting. I mean, they know you're reading notes, but it looks like you're calling somebody, you're texting somebody, okay? And besides, when you're looking down and your shoulders are hunched, that's a, pair, that's a posture of defeat. That's not what you want to convey. No, no. You want to be up there dealing with and engaging with your audience. So unless it's, unless it's the State of the Union address or you, you, you know, you're, you're opening parliament, uh, you've got to actually just speak to people. Don't read your remarks. Can't stress this one enough. You've got to rehearse. You've got to rehearse. And I know some people think, gee, if I rehearse, that'll flatten out my presentation. My spontaneity will go away. No, it won't. It will not. I've delivered this presentation, I can't tell you how many times, but the audience is always different. The audience is always different, and that makes the talk different. Don't worry about it. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Don't let your brain fool you into thinking you're ready. Don't go through it 
and think, okay, I'll talk about this, and then I'll talk about that, and I've got, I know about that, I got this covered. No, no, you've actually got to get up and actually vocalize your thoughts, because otherwise you'll be, oh, what was that, what was that phrase? I, I, can't, I can't bring it to mind. That's what you'll be doing up there, and people can tell you're doing it. They don't want to see someone finding his way through a forest with a flashlight. They want to see somebody who actually knows his stuff. So rehearse until you get it right. I, I work with one guy who was a great speaker, and everybody thought he was a natural. And they expressed that in front of his administrative assistant once, and she laughed. She said, you don't understand. Whenever he gives a talk, I've heard it six times already through his door. He's in there alone practicing. That's why he's good. It's because he rehearses. And if you rehearse enough, you can work without a net. Do you see me with notes? Did you see Vince with notes? Did you see any notes at all? No. And if you know what you're talking about, you can talk without notes, and this is better. Because this suggests to the audience that you actually know your stuff, that you don't need a crib sheet. If you've if you got a net, you're probably going to use it. Uh, the, the, I, I forget which one of the flying Walendas it was. One of the, uh, or, or no, not, not the flying Walendas. It, it, was, it was another group that did the high wire. But their patriarch said, listen, don't use a net when you're up there. If you use a net and you start getting in trouble, your instinct is just to fall and let it go. He said, have faith in your skill to walk that wire. Have faith in that. That's what to put your faith in, not the net. You can get injured falling in a net. You concentrate on staying on the wire, right? That's what you want to do by rehearsing. And the other reason that you want to rehearse is that you want to make it as smooth as a golf swing. You got to practice a golf swing to make it smooth. You got to practice it over and over and over again until it becomes part of your muscle memory. Anybody ever here listen to a TED talk? Yeah, all right. They're good, aren't they? Yeah. Nancy Duarte, who gives TED talks, you know how much she rehearses for a TED talk? 200 hours. 200 hours. Who of us has 200 hours? But that's how you make a good talk. The more you rehearse, the better you're going to be. So rehearse. I mentioned eye contact before, but here's a rule. Don't do, there, there's a couple of ways of doing this thing. It's like, I'm looking at you, but really I'm not looking at you. I'm looking all over the place. We call this aerosol eyes. All right? My eyes are moving around here like an aerosol. They're not really landing anywhere, and I'm not engaging you. Now I'm engaging you. Now I'm talking to you just like we're the only two guys in the room, and that's fine. And when I'm done, I can drop my voice. I can walk over here, and I can talk to you for a while, just like we're the only two guys in the room. All right, and, and that's it. All we've got to do is talk to each other, and I'm conversational, and when I'm done, I drop my voice, and I look over here. If you've got a big auditorium, go around in a figure like a figure eight lying on its side, and just go here, 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 and everybody will think you talk to them and you engage your audience. Speak only to eyes. That's the way to success. That's the way to engagement. And hold that eye contact at least five seconds. There, we're done. And finally, oh, let's talk about hands for a while, all right? Hands. Number one, everybody, they've got to see your hands if they're going to trust you. This is kind of primeval, all right? Uh, I, I don't know why it is, but if I were back here and I never raised my hands up, all right, you wouldn't be too sure of me then, would you? And it's all because you can't see my hands especially the open palms of your hands. Now, the way your palms face, that's important. See what this guy's doing here? This is the, like the fish measure gesture, palms in, all right? This is the gesture you use to share things with people. You say, here's what I want you to take away from here. Bam, you pass them something. It's like you're passing them something. Your hands are together in the fish measure gesture and you do that. Now, try to make this somewhere between your belt and your neck. That's, that's the good area for gestures. All right? Some people, I judge speech tournaments sometimes and I can't believe it. There are students, speech competitors who are good at what they do, and somebody coached them that when they're not gesturing, they rest their hands at their sides. Okay, gentlemen, I'm resting my hands at my sides. Do I look like I'm even alive? Have I lost use of my arms? What's going on here? Do you talk to people like this? No, you've got your hands up here at belt level, ready to gesture, ready to show your energy, ready to make your point. That shows the excitement. Now, it's between about here and here. If you go up here, it better be important. All right? The higher your hands, the more the energy you're conveying. 
So before you go to jazz hands, make sure that it's really important stuff you're going to, okay? Um, the position of the palm. Let me talk about that a minute because that's important. Palm up is a good appealing gesture. When I've appeared in front of hostile audiences, and I have, uh, when I ask for questions, I will ask for them like this because it is less threatening than pointing. This is better. That is controlling. It is no accident that the Nazi, the fascist salute, is a palm down salute. This says, I am here to control you. That's what it's meant to say. Suppose I do this. Completely different meaning. Doesn't mean that at all, does it? The way the palm faces makes a big difference. So, you want your audience to like you? Palm open, palm open. Whatever you do, you may feel like doing this. You know, if you get a little nervous before you speak, some people get out there and they do this, all right? Or, 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 or they do that, or God forbid they do this. Okay, the fig leaf. Uh, and what that says is, I'm nervous. Because instinctively we protect our middle when we feel threatened. That's where our hands go. If you feel like doing this, do that. You may not be less nervous, but you look less nervous. You look a lot less nervous, okay? So those are a few things that you can do with your hands. There are some other things. The important thing is that your gestures be real and spontaneous, that they come from your heart. Now, I tell you the truth. I know the gestures that I'm doing, but I'm not planning them. I've seen people get up there saying, on the one hand, yeah, it's like, fine, fine, you choreograph that. We understand, all right? No, no, no. You don't want choreographed gestures. You want real gestures. You want gestures that reflect who you are and what you're feeling. That carries credibility. And finally, you got to have a good closing. You got to have a good closing. If you, so many people squander this opportunity. So many people, when they end, they say, well, uh, that was my last slide. I hope you got something out of it. You know, and just, the energy level goes way down. Nobody cares. No, no, you, you're up there to make a point. You had an objective. Speak to your objective. And if it's possible, have a call to action. Begin the journey. Join the fight. Donate today. End with something. End with a point. End with something they're going to remember and take out of the room with them. You've had them for 15 or 20 minutes or however long it's been. Tell them why they were there. They expect you to connect the dots. They want you to connect the dots. Do it. Be the speaker and tell them why they're there. Speaking is one of the most powerful things you can do. Do you know why? It's because it is the broadest band communication there is. You not only hear my voice, you see my body language, you see my eyes, you see everything about me, and you can assess everything that I do. And I can assess you too. I know, I mean, I know when you're looking here, I know when you're looking somewhere else. See, you think you're invisible, you're not. Every speaker knows this. They read the audience and it's a great gift. The body language is what we give each other. And this interaction, this engagement, is something that can make you known as a great speaker. Good speakers can move audiences. Great ones can move mountains. If you're a great speaker, you will be noted. Do you have any questions for me on any of this? Or any concerns? Anybody do any public speaking? I hear one back there. Yes. Uh, the question is asked, is there any point in your professional career where likability can be a liability instead of an asset? And that's a very interesting question. And I'll be, uh, I, I gotta be up front. I'd never actually thought of it that way. I guess I've never seen any instances of that. If you are well-liked, it's generally for a reason. Now, there's a distinction between being well-liked and being popular, all right? There's a distinction between that. I have known people who are very popular uh, oh, I'm, I'm going back to my high school days here, who would run for class office, and you know, the popularity, let's call it the status, the status, it disappears. Because all of the people who do not have high status get an equal vote, and they take their vengeance in the polls. In that case, it's bad. But if you're liked, if you're actually liked, and for the right reasons, and for the right reasons, generally this is a helpful thing. I cannot think of an instance where there's been a liability. Have you or have any of you known, known that to be the case? Yes. Uh, 
Ah, yeah, I understand where we're going now, yeah. In an instance where you become a yes man, oh yeah, I understand where you're going. Sure, if you're just obsequious, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to be popular just for the sake of it. Eh, they don't really like you then, do they? Because you're trying too hard. You're trying too hard, you don't really mean it, all right? You don't really mean the things, you don't really stand for anything if you're a yes man. No, no. Being liked doesn't mean that you're a pushover. Being well-liked doesn't mean that you are agreeable to everybody no matter what. You can take a stand, but people can respect that. Because we respect people who take stands when they take them for good reasons. No, no. I understand the tenor of the question now, and I think you're exactly right. If you're obsequious, that's no good. Likeability is, I think you're okay. And if I think you're okay, I'm willing to deal with you. Other questions? Any others? Yes. Yeah, you. We're fortunate to be in leadership positions where we're going to have opportunities to make presentations like we've been discussing. What can we potentially do to offer opportunities like that to the other brothers and general body of our chapters back at our university? What can you do to offer presentation of possibilities to other brothers in the chapter? You're leaders, so you get to present, and they may not get to. Well, you might take them aside. First of all, you might trust them with something and say, hey, I want to put you in charge of this thing. Get this together and let us know what you thought. Give a presentation on that. If you think somebody's got the potential, let them, let them have a trial run. Now, you probably can't do this with every brother in the chapter, but you can with a selected few that you think have good potential. You might try that. And I think we got time for one more question. Yes? There, there are two ways of doing that. The, the thing is, I was taught never to end with questions. And you know what? I won't. <laughs> if you take nothing else out, take this, gentlemen, the three things. Content, visuals, delivery. All right? You have the last word. Not the questioner, but you. That's exactly right, and it's good advice. Wonderful. I hope you all become great speakers. God bless you, and good night.